Now, demons are very smart. I want to just talk about a little bit of that. You see, you get a demon that makes you drink like a fish. But that demon is not there to make you drink like a fish. It is a spirit of bondage. Under the demon is other demons that come and they break the marriage. So the, the aim is for you to be single all, the, all your life, but you drink like a fish. So you're thinking, I'm a nice lady. I just have a drinking problem. And you think that if you get together with a guy <clears throat> that also drinks, that things will be okay. But you will find that even though he drinks, it's not coming from a certain devil. It's just a weakness that he has. But your one is demonic. Christians are defeated. Now, I, <coughs> excuse me. I've been looking at, at life and the quality of the believer's life. Because I, I research and I do, I, my, my research methodology is through exercise. Just to give you a little bit of an example. Every time I reach a certain level of prayer, when time allows it, where I can go away and pray, every time I reach that level of prayer, I always notice there are people who have not been in church. They just suddenly appear. And then I began to understand that there's another dimension in their life that is more powerful than church attendance. When I pray for them on that level, they pop up in church. And I say, but it's been six months. They cannot explain how they've not come to church. The life of the flesh, the life of a creature, is in the blood. What makes you talk too much? It's in your blood. But with the life I'm talking about is a very low level life because it is sustained by mechanical energy. Something is sustaining it through mechanical energy. You need a heartbeat to, to sustain this life. The moment that heart stops, no matter how far you're going, you're going to Kenya, you're going to America, you, you're successful, you know? The moment that heart stops, everything stops. Maybe you, for the first time you've been praying and asking for breakthrough, and for some reason, by reason of the Lord per adventure, breakthrough comes. Breakthrough comes. Breakthrough comes. Ne? And you begin to celebrate with your friends and say, wow, finally my husband. Finally breakthrough. Finally job. When you're about to enjoy what the Lord has given to you, heart failure. Why? Because the life of the creature is in the blood. So that demon will wait for you to reach a point where you're about to enjoy the fruits of your labor, take you up. That's why Jesus said, you fool. This very night, your life will be taken from you. So what I'm saying is, do not mistake it. When we say life here at church, don't mistake it from the mechanical life that's in your chest. Because that one is sustained by mechanical energy. It is a lower level frequency. For lack of a better word. Then we talk about things like blood pressure. This is what that scripture is talking about. But I'm, I'm not really wanting to focus, even though, you know, I have a proclivity to look at the biological side because that is the essence of our life. I want to talk about the, the spiritual aspect, the subtle aspect of the blood. God said to Cain, your, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Because when his blood got shed, the earth said, ah, 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 this blood is not on my head. The earth rejected Abel's blood. And Abel's blood was crying out for revenge for all of mankind. Everyone, every male that was, was to enter the earth, the cosmos, from that moment on, would have to answer for the blood of Abel. That is why it was very important that that scripture is there. So the subtle aspect of your blood carries the mistakes of your forefathers. But you have got to go to the conveyor belt and start sorting things out. Christians today are ignorant and irresponsible. They just run for deep teachings where they can access power and get anointings 
but no character change. So they go high in the spirit. They start churches. Thousands flock to them. Everybody is blessed. When they open their mouth, everybody is blessed. But six months into the ministry, two years into the ministry, fornication. Why? Because it was in the blood. That thing that makes you say, no man, this is my life. I know you mean well, you want, you want Jesus. You were here, you're sitting so beautifully, looking to change your life, hmm? looking to become a better believer, a better Christian. But the blood, that's why I sang that song. That's why Jesus shed his blood. He says in John 10.10, 10, the thief. But I have come. He didn't say, I have died. His arrival alone was to give you life and life more abundantly. The life you're living in your chest now cannot sustain itself. It has a beginning and an end. The life I'm talking about to you today is sustenance itself. This is the difference between a Christian and a non-believer, a non-Christian. As you're sitting there now, you have inherited life forever. You see, you, you see, instead of worrying about prophecies, get to understand the full meaning of that. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So you choose whether you will go after the subtle life and the life of and the blood that comes with that life is the blood of the lamb. So that brings everything that Jesus inherited. We are heirs of God and heirs of Christ. You've been reading the scriptures. I'm trying to give you an elucidation. You turn to the blood of Jesus. All of a sudden, you begin to inherit the life of Jesus. And that overrides the life that is in the flesh. But you've got to invoke the blood of Jesus for that to happen. We don't talk enough about the blood of Jesus. We sing a little bit about it, but we don't understand. And demons are quite satisfied. They're quite happy that in other dexterities we are prospering. We're quite powerful in other things. When comes the blood of Jesus, they're happy to minimize conversation there because, I mean, don't talk too much because then, then your behavior changes. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. It says, if you walk in the light as he is in light, then the blood of Christ Jesus cleanses you from all sin. So what is this man saying? There is a life. That is sustained by mechanical energy. It's sustained by the motion of something that's made of tissue. Human tissue. At any time it can fail. So if I chase that life, I end up with sorrow. Psalm 90. By reason of strength, the heart is good. You can reach 80 years. You can reach 80 years. By reason of strength, peradventure, some kind of blessing, good diet. But when the heart begins to fail, your plans come to zero. To become the best sister, you buy all the GTIs, all the cars, and you start telling people, God has blessed me, you spoke too soon. God blessing you is abundant life. The life that is inside us that is beating, you are so confident in it. You are, you are too confident in it. This is the problem. Who woke you up this morning? Have you ever asked yourself what happens? I went to pray for a young boy from a Muslim family. Things, things were coming to a point where the doctor told them, right, we're going to switch everything off. And, and then we'll, we'll let him go because he's not responding. You know when things reach that point? 
You know when things reach a point? Yes. So we enter a situation like that. They, they give us scrub everything. Me and Pastor Dean, we had to go into ICU and Mercantile Hospital. Very high level stuff. When I stood there before this boy, he was black and blue. It's no life. I stood there, I pray for him. You can ask Pastor D, I pray for him. Nothing happened. I said, okay, God, I've prayed, but now I need to understand. I need to understand, what do I do to bring this boy back? I prayed. But he is not waking up. You see, a lot of you, you think that after you prayed, God should just take all the boxes. You're mistaken. God wants more than prayer from you. He wants the life you live after the prayer to match what you said in your prayer. You know, you pray so beautifully. And the angel ticks. But then there are other, the afterlife. If your prayer comprises of something that is going to change that destiny, there needs to be a level of righteousness that sustains that prayer for at least two weeks. After you pray, then the miracle action starts. When I stood there, God said, look at the machine. When it reaches 120, this boy opened his eyes. I look at the machine. It starts going up. God says, stretch your hand. The more I stretch my hand, the faster the machine was going towards. And lo and behold, at that number, the young man would open his eyes. No, I don't need to clap your hands. God said, the life of the creature is in the blood. This one, you, look, look, look. Huh? Look, so easy. A lot of you young ladies, you are putting too much emphasis on this outer mechanical life. You are 20, 25, 30. You want to get married. By the time you hit 40, 45, the outer man begins to tell you that this one is beating, but it's no longer beating enough for elasticity of the skin. Then you begin to realize, hey, there is a decline. I put so much energy in this one. And then you want to run to Bible now. To the life eternal. <laughs> Jesus, why am I not getting married? Uh -uh, you're only looking at this life now. Why didn't you do it at 25? No matter how beautiful you think you are, Yes, you are beautiful, but one or two strikes, a little bit of sickness, no one will recognize you again. Your, your own relatives. No man stays here. Teaching. You are um, so. Last week. <laughs> Last week. Why don't we take Instagram picture now? Now, let's take it. Let them see what you're going through. Let them see what you're going through. Now, with black eye. Now, your teeth has been removed. Now. Before that. Now, your smile. Ah, where's, the, where's the smile? The mechanical life. It's so pathetic. I want my brothers and sisters to hear me today. It's too pathetic for us. You think, now, now you think, God touching you and blessing you hmm, is for this life, less than 100 years. You think Jesus worked so hard just for you to experience 20 years of some kind of miracle. You're mistaken. The Bible says in this age and the age to come, Still don't get me. Now, I told my wife today's message is called take off. Look at your neighbor and say, take off. <clears throat> I'm going to, I need ashes to come. Just three or four loose ones. Now, I'm going to use an example because I've, I've shared and I look at you and I say, oh, you don't get me 100%. So let me use an example. As I did say to the angel, I need an example because you know how they are. Especially when they're not eaten. You know? Wait. 
lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets you and run the race. Now you've got to make a decision what you're going to put in the suitcase. You end up finding out there's a whole lot of stuff that you have that you don't need. There's a whole lot of people that you have that you don't need. Your WhatsApp's got 115 contacts, but you've never spoken to at least 50 of those people in the past two years. You thought that when you met them and you had a conversation and there was a spark, it meant that they should be a friend. Once they become a WhatsApp contact, you don't even know whether they're online or not. There's a lot, you know, my pastor is better now. At some point, the whole house was filled with shoes. Filled with shoes. I said, put your shoes out. She put all her shoes out. And then she brought the boxes of shoes that we had bought. That she has never put her foot in. Some of you ladies are like, give me her WhatsApp. When we were going past, are you still hearing me? When we were going past the shoe in the shop, Mama Pastor is like, this is the shoe. This is the shoe. I'm a, this is the shoe. That sounds familiar. I've heard that before just, just last week. She, she's collecting a lay-by. Uh, lay-by shoes. But, but yesterday, no, these are boots. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm using my wife as an example to show you what you do with people. Like this guy, I don't know, I just got a good feeling about him. Is he your friend? Are you sure? No, definitely, this is the one. This one, this one. Now, this is the one. I can just feel it. But once you get the ticket, sweetheart, only people with a ticket on the same flight as you are coming with. And they're going to make that choice by themselves. You can't make them, you can't share the ticket with them. You can't, you can try to... At some point, go stand there as a boarding pass guy. At some point, I say, Uncle Gary, I'm leaving. I will see you by and by. I don't hate you. You're not a bad guy. But my flight is separating us. What shall I do for you, Elisha? I want a double portion. He said, if you see me go, There was over a hundred prophets that day, but they were at a distance. You know how people love you from a distance? Care about you from a distance? Wisen you up from a distance? It's only when you die, then they come. Yellow, yellow. Mm -hmm. A few people will be crying at your funeral and really mean it. There will be somebody sitting at your funeral that will be going, Is it Auntie Nita's curry? She's making you all nice. I'm hungry. You are hungry. Your friend is dead. <laughs> Listen, I go to funerals. Some of the people I'm talking to like this, next thing, I have to bury you. I hope when, I, when that day comes, I'm burying you. You are dancing in heaven. That's my hope. All this teaching. All this teaching, if you go to hell, I will ask God, let me go and shambok him. When I'm going, I leave the house and I drive to the airport and I have to board the plane.
it's not my name that really matters. It's the boarding pass. It's not my weight. It's the boarding pass. I can greet this guy all I want. Nothing will go through but the boarding pass. It's the barcode on the boarding pass. It was that's what let me through. There's a little beep in your life. Just one beep that will qualify you for the next. Not your sister's support. You gotta put your luggage in and they weigh your luggage. This is where you're gonna find out. You thought you packed well. This is where you're going to find out when they take it through the scan. They're going to stop you and they're going to frisk you. It don't matter how important you are, they tell you, take off your belt. How many of you caught a plane before? <coughs> Lift up your hand. We need to pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we need to pray over here. Not even mango. They take off your belt, bruh. They search. If they open your goods, if you pack some funny stuff, everybody gonna see that stuff. Hmm? What is this? You know, most you can't take this on the plane. When I boarded a plane, I was on my way somewhere. When I got there, I was chatting away with the lady because she was happy. So I was happy too. I said, Buti, open this cosmetic bag. I'm opening zip. She said, uh-uh, man, you can't take this. My gift, my pastor gave me, I forgot my utility knife inside. There's no turning back. It gets dumped. She said to me, ooh, your wife is going to be very unhappy because goodbye. They, they take things from you. Now, some of you are boarding a plane and you're starting to lose stuff. <laughs> you're starting to lose stuff that you think you need, that you think you need for this journey, but God knows you don't need it. And he's got angels that go check you out. And unfortunately, at this point in your life, all your business is open. I'm taking my time until you take the journey with me. We, we haven't even started yet. If you can pass the boarding pass and let God empty your suitcase of all the things that you think you need or think you want, you qualify to fly. It may be something that is so meaningful to you it may rattle you, but once you cross that line, there's no turning back. Now, all this time, now, now listen, this is where a lot of Christians are stuck. They're stuck at the boarding gate. Because they don't want to let go. But this is, this is everything to me. This is my life. This is my time. God's like, we need to minimize to travel size. Because where you're going, you're going to live another life. And I've, I've, uh, he says, behold, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. So he knows what you need. He knows exactly what you need. Up until that moment, life will be tough because it's decision making. But sweetheart, if you can make up your mind that I want to fly, I want to board that plane, that decision is crossing that line. From then on, you will be boarded onto an airplane. And you'll come through this way. Follow me, Uncle Gary. Now, <coughs> when you start to board a plane, there's a loud noise. I wish you could get me, I wish Pastor D could get me like a, a jet sound. I really want them to understand this. Especially folks that haven't been on a plane before. They don't know that you can't talk to your friend while you're boarding a plane because you can't hear nothing. Because that engine is loud. 
It's not the way I thought it was. And when I'm boarding this plane, it's a straight line. Call me when you get there. Huh? Call me when you get there. I love you. Yesterday we were in the same bed, but today... This is what you realize. That the higher up you go, the further away you get from people that are not flying. You get a new set of friends. You don't get to pick these friends. You're associated by the decision you made. Why are we in this room? You know what brought us here together? We booked the same flight. We don't know each other, but we booked the same flight. Maybe if I met you on the street, I would never greet you. But here you are next to me. We may not agree on the street, but because we booked the same flight, we agree. And we're going to be together for some time. Now let's book the flight. Can I get a chair in here? Just a chair. A chair for my passengers as well. You're going to be my, my passenger on this side. That's one. Have a seat. Another passenger over there. Perfect. See, after this, the boarding guy, I'm done with him. You don't, you don't get it, do you? Okay, so I'm not going to... I, I booked window seat. <coughs> what kind of air hostess is this? Give me that chair. I'm going to sit right here. I'm good. This is definitely economy class. Thank you, sir. See, a lot of folks, are you still with me? A lot of folks still talking about that kind of message. You get to a level where you don't even want to listen to T.D. Jakes no more. I know you thought something weird happened. You thought a devil got into you. That message was for when you were a certain level. Now you've grown. Now you need to hear something deeper. I, I, I'm motivated. That's why I'm on the plane. But I need more than motivation now. I need to know how this plane will take off. T.D. Jakes helped me in my boarding, and I love him. But I can never keep T.D. Jakes for the rest of my life. First thing you need to know is two things about the plane. We'll do the first one and the last one, and I'll let you go. This one. It's the takeoff. Now, if you've been in a plane, you can be the pilot. I want to let you go. Come on, come be the pilot. <laughs> Just, yeah, you know, that's good. You don't get to see the pilot. Are you listening to me? You don't get to see the pilot. He introduces himself. Hi, my name is Captain So-and-so. We're -so. flying at 20 degrees. Nah, 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 nah. We'll be there in approximately 37 minutes. Yeah. Sit back, relax, enjoy the flight. Thank you for flying safe. You, you need to be guided by a voice. Pilot's not going to hold your hand. You don't come back. You all right? <laughs> this is your first time flying. You, we're going to be all right. I assure you, this plane is 100% safe. That's for baby Christians. Baby Christians need to be confident every single day.
today. You got to hear that little message of, come on. God, that view, when you, when you, when you grown up, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I'm, now, now, now I'm grown up. I'm grown up. I'm grown up. I can cry. Wipe my tears and continue praying. I'm grown up now. I'm grown up now. I don't need the prophet's appointment every single week. I'm grown up. I can figure this out. That's why I ignore you. When you want to see me. If I want to speak to you. If God wants me to say something to you. I know where to find you. But if I ain't saying nothing to you. Keep moving. Figure it out. The power is in figuring it out. The power is in figuring it out. The power is giving yourself the freedom to make a couple of mistakes before you get it right. Christians are afraid of failure. Because you put on an act. You know you ain't all that. The devil knows you ain't all that. But in here, we try to act all spiritual. If I give the mic to some of y'all, I'm going to hear some evangel you know, evangelistic stuff, ecclesiastical stuff. And you ain't even like that. Your accent changes when you get the mic. You want to show everybody you got great faith? It's not going to happen by talking. If you're going to be here around for another 10 years, still say amen, maybe I'll start listening to you. But, but when you're flying, you begin to understand that there's altitudes. Now, now let me get to what I'm saying. When a when jet's going off, they tell me to fasten my seatbelt and brace myself. Hmm. The scariest part for those of you who ain't caught a plane yet, the takeoff and landing. Oh my gosh, that changes a man. Some of you gonna act like I ain't scared no more, but you you just got used to it. Back in your mind, you think he better you better know what he's doing now. You don't even know if the pilot's flying for the first time. Nobody tells you that. You just gotta trust and believe. Now, now here's what I'm getting to. When the plane reaches a certain altitude, now here's what I want you to hear me. If you take some time to look out the window, make sure it's window seat, y'all. You got a book window seat. Otherwise, this means nothing. And you look down, and you think, is that the size of the house I can't afford to pay rent for? You look down, and you're thinking, that's the size of my street with my finger. You, you see, when you're up there, you measure. <laughs> when you're up there, one kilometer, you can measure it with your finger. So it's the point of view. Same person. Same believer. Just a little higher. And here's the beauty. What is keeping this thing in the air? What is keeping this airplane in the air? It ain't the pilot. It ain't Superman underneath. It's called faith. Cars look small. That big X5 you've been praying about, can't even see it. This is what I've been telling you. Mechanical life. Every believer is at a certain stage. Stop comparing yourself. Stop competing. Try competing against yourself. Before you compete with your neighbor. Compete against your attitude. Compete against your arrogance. Compete against your stubbornness first. If you can overcome that one, we can talk. 
the brace of taking off is faith changing altitude now there's something you haven't realized I'm no longer using my feet there's a point where the believers life no longer functions by his own mechanical energy there's a point in your life where God's gonna take you there behold I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the land somebody gonna bring you sweetheart I know your neighbors got there with their connects but you somebody is gonna bring you into your situation that's why you have nothing that's why you don't have the connection in the government house because there's an angel that's been assigned to bring you this is why for the believer life will always look like you're left behind but don't get too used to the flight because there's a point in the flight where it feels like you're floating this is where the Christian begins to experience really beautiful stuff from heaven starting to see visions and dreams <laughs> and you might think this is it this is the zenith of spiritual life now some of us we caught a plane a few times and we realize that wait a minute this ain't it can this be it where I say I'm spiritual because God visits me with angels every single week that can't be it a visitation to an abiding a visitation to an abiding it means that if God is visiting me it means it means we're not that close if we were close he would want to stay he says if you do my commandment me and my daddy are gonna come in and we're gonna dine with you a lot of people want a visitation from God and when they get a visitation they think wow some of you come into this church because you think God is visiting this church. You're mistaken. He lives here. And, and I wish you would take him home and stop visiting him. God doesn't want to visit you like some crazy neighbor. He wants to live with you. He wants to live in you. The falling under the power is a visitation. The speaking in tongues is a visitation. Listen, the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, the demonstration of the power. This is a demo. This ain't it. You think the ultimate experience, some of you don't go to church no more because you think this is it. You're mistaken. Oh my Lord, you're mistaken. And the point of this flight, you can begin to get arrogant because you see things from a different level. The only difference between you and the Christian on the ground is perspective. Humble yourself. All I need to do is put you in the emergency boot and get you out of there. And within a few seconds, you will realize that it ain't that small. Perspective changes everything. Now comes the landing. This is the problem. You can't land. You're scared. If you've been in a plane, I wish my team would help me out. At least show you what landing looked like. Now, I took my wife on our anniversary. I said, where do you want to go? She said, I want to go to Joburg. I want to go to China Mall. I want to see the new Mall of Africa. I said, okay, we can do that for this anniversary. Now, when we boarded the plane, everything was cool. I'm like, relaxed now. I'm laid back. When we were taking off, I felt my wife's hand gripping me. I'm like, what's going on? I said, oh. I'm like, don't don't worry, it's, it's gonna be all right. And then I and then we relax again. And then when the landing came through, she broke my hand. <laughs> Let me tell you, you can tell folks ain't been on a plane before when it's a landing. Folks stand up like something gonna happen. Like for some reason, if I stand up, I'm gonna survive the sweetheart. All you can do is fasten the seatbelt. And the seatbelt is the word of truth that you received about your life. That's all you got. All you got is that word of God that you got to hold on to. Now, now, if you're big, 
You need to tighten that belt real good. You just need to adjust that seat belt. But you can't hold on to that belt forever. It's not a belt that you wear to keep your clothes together. It's just a word for the season. I wish people could hear me. Some of you are still carrying a word that's out of season. Because you liked it. And it gave you comfort. And gave you assurance that you're going to make it. Maybe the word of this season is a tough one. And you can't handle it. Because that's a tighter grip of the belt. Because God knows you're about to land. The two messiest parts of a believer's life is the takeoff and the landing. You're not hearing me. Let me get past this pilot and show you what I'm talking about. Listen, if, if, if you come to my house and I'm working and everything is all over the place, you need to forgive me. I'm landing. Things were prim and proper, and, I, and it looked like I figured my life out. But, but, but at, the land, at the landing, at the landing, it's scary. It's messy at the landing. The Christian, it's all prim and proper. He's still on the journey. He's going to be like, you all right? No, I'm not. This is why you get a word. So my question to you is, has the plane ever landed? Because if the plane has landed, that makeup not going to look the same. The sister next to you that's crying, that she's losing her mind, and you think she's being emotional, and she's overdoing it and making noise in the church, you don't understand what a landing is. See, my daughter came up here talking about the kids were busy adopting. We lost one of our loved ones. My son, my son passed away last year. Lived a day old, disappeared. And my daughter just landed. See, when you're landing, only people who have caught a plane before know what you're going through. We are separated by our experiences. The level of our strength is defined by what we have encountered. It takes time for something to establish itself. You need to be patient. And the Bible says, let patience finish her good work in you. difference in the gap in life and experience between you and her is time what you see in front of you and her is a product of what she said yes to and what she said no to now you have a privilege to check her list and see what she said yes to that she should have said no to See how you can stop the brace. That's why you need somebody else in life to help you. You can't, you can't land on your own. Pilot doesn't come out and hold your hand. All you got is the word and that belt. And that luggage, it's not going to be in the same place when you open it. That's why you needed to travel light. Yeah, but you're talking about an airplane. You're not hearing me. When you get off that airplane, you start all over again. New friends. New faces. And if there's people that you love, they boarded the plane, I pray that you see them on the other side. But chances are, you're not going to see them. I want to move in miracles. I want God to use me. Lovely. You need to land with them. You need a landing. 
Yo, 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 yo can go home and just this, you really understand what I'm talking about if you just go to YouTube and watch a plane landing. Fire comes out. Fire comes out of the tires. And you don't even know what your name is no more. You hear me, brother? How are you going to know that you have arrived? He's not some big preacher telling you to jump up and down and scream and say hallelujah. You're going to know you've arrived by a thud. Are you with me? You guys don't get it. Many times you landed and you started crying and you thought God abandoned you. You're going to know if you landed by a thud. By a shake. Sometimes a plane goes and it goes in the air and, and then eventually there's a landing. Am I talking to anybody here who knows a little bit of what I'm talking about? All the faith you had in your life gotta come out there. All that deep faith, that real faith, your faith go to a different level. You brace yourself. I mean, you holding the chair is not going to change anything. But you need to hold on to something. You hear what I'm saying? You caught a plane before? You caught a plane before? Who caught a plane before? You caught a plane? Sister, come, come let, me, let me talk to you a little bit. Tell me your experience. Tell me your experience. Come on now. Get a mic. Face the crowd. Now, when you, when you were scared, you need to say when you were scared. You see, people are sitting here and they've never been in an airplane. So if you don't tell them the truth, they're going to hate you. All right, let's start, with, let's start with the boarding. Okay. You obviously show your... your boarding pass. Your, yeah, your boarding pass. And then tell you to go outside so that you can go in the plane. And then, obviously, the engine is very loud. You can't hear no one. And you go up the stairs on the plane. So the, the stairs, right? Yes. So the stairs separate you and ground level. Separates you from what you used to know. What you, you see, you see it's, it's not straight anymore. It's up. And you better watch your step. On ground level, you believe that the steps were in a book. But when you get on stairs, you realize, no, the, step, the steps are not in a book. And then, bring the mic closer to her. <laughs> and then you um, go sit on your seat, and then the pilot will say, um, okay, it's time to... Okay, let's fast forward to take off. How'd you feel? <laughs> First you, time. You actually get, um, your ears get deaf. Like you can't hear nothing. It's like oh yes, now we talk. Oh, yeah. there's a little deafening that goes on. <laughs> you know, every time you, you to open it. So forgive me if I'm a little deaf. Because <laughs> on, on this journey, something happens. All right, and then tell me um, when you when 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 you when you were told to brace yourself for landing, and the plane landed. <laughs> How'd you feel? Yeah, I was very scared because I was sitting alone. I was like, Phew. So the thought crossed your mind, this pilot might not make it. <laughs> oh, we got some... Can, can we kill the lights? I want you to see this. Because you're flying today. Come on, turn those lights out. <clears throat> I just want you to watch this. That's how we sing those songs. Goodbye, world. I stand no longer with you. 
goodbye pleasures upset. If, if you can say goodbye, you'll achieve a lot in life. Mm -hmm. When it makes this turn, and you know about this turn, if you've flown before, you know it. For the first time, it's like, it's like mm, this is like driving. Straightforward. What were they talking about? And then there's that turn it makes and stands still. <laughs> then you know what's about to go down. Then that pilot turn it up. Yeah, you're still parallel parking. Any more volume than that? I want them to hear it. What do you hear? Hallelujah. Sound like God talking too fast now, ain't he? That with your heartbeat. Why are you showing us a plane? What kind of pastor is this? I'm trying to educate y'all. Understand how God works. The journey is long. By this time, you go into airplane mode. You can't WhatsApp your friend and say, It's moving, it's moving. <laughs> Does this one. Does this one land, Pastor? Let's get a landing. Why don't you turn off the lights when I tell you to turn off the lights? What's wrong with you? All these ushers and they can't turn out the light. Oh, this load shedding. <laughs> Here we go. Not from inside the cabin. Oh, this, this is okay though. See, when people watch you from outside, it looks smooth. <laughs> landing looks nice, don't it? Huh. From the outside, the landing looks beautiful. Everybody wants to land. But when you're on the inside, when your faith is tested, when you've got to believe for your sister, when you've got to believe that cancer is healed, when you've got to believe that AIDS is healed, you with me now? The, the, the landing is the believing. I, I, do you get me, sister? You know why I'm laboring? Because I want you to understand what I'm saying. The landing is the believing. When you, when you finally believe, then the tires come out. Ask your neighbor, have you landed? <laughs> Can I get the mic? I want to chat to the people quickly. Uh, ask Mama G, where does she think she is in a journey? Honestly, based on the experience. Uh, hi, everybody. Oh. Honestly, I think I'm in, uh, still on the floating mode. <laughs> yes. Still in the air. Okay, so oh, yeah. you, you, you're cruising now. Yeah. Okay, she's cruising. Is she made it on the plane? Okay, that's one. Yeah. Let's hear somebody else. Papa, where do you think you're at? I'm at that point where I know God is faithful to his word. And he never lets you down, irrespective of what you're going through. And he's put me through many trials, many trials where I can physically know. <laughs> so the physical pain changed the way you thought? Yes, definitely. It, it refined your I believe. When the you believe say I is, believe. You see, we, we've got a notion that we want to see things happen. And God shows it to us, but sometimes we're too blind to notice it. And when you really notice it, you start to know how God works. So what if the evidence increases in the opposite direction? It, the evidence that you're going to die becomes more and louder than your prayer. The evidence becomes more? Louder than your prayer. You're praying, I'm healed, I'm healed. But the more you pray, the more you're in the sickbed. What do you do then? You still trust. As what? I said, you, you come to a point where you know God comes through to his word. He's true to his word. He can't lie. He mm -hmm. can't lie. That's, that's, that's it's just a, sometimes you cannot uh, 
explain it in words and so forth. But you come to a point where you just know, I don't know how to explain it to you, Pastor. You just know he's going to come through for you. There's a knowing in your knowing. There's a knowing. You can't explain it to the, to the neighbor. They just, they got to book a flight for that. That's why we teach principles. Because we don't want you to lose it along the way. Lots of you, you started well. You started well. One of the sisters here was testifying that she was churching up and she felt the Lord. And at some point, things changed. So this is my question to you now. Where are you? Are you still packing? Are you still deciding whether to let something go? Or take it with? Where are you? Be honest with yourself. Are you really cruising? Have you landed? Are you on the other side? Or you failed to wake up on time for your flight? So this, this silence and talking over it is called meditation. We are meditating on the word now. I'm meditating on the word we've received. Where am I? Where am I? Sila. Sila. Where am I? Sila. Like the psalmist says. Where am I, Lord? How long? How long before you return on high on earth? How long will it take? Ask yourself. And meditate. Take count. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Forget all the up and down and fire, fire. That's just the jet engine. Where are you? Your marriage, where is it? Where's your marriage? Where's your faith now? Will it survive the next 10 years? Or will you be back in the club in no time? The things God led to happen to us is to define the level and the genuineness of our faith. I'm not a man of God because people get healed. Don't be too quick to say, this is a prophet. Just because miracles, and then he mentioned your sister's name and tell you everything. That's a gift. Who the prophet is, is what you must trust. If that prophet has walked with God 30 years, 20 years, and landed, you can learn it one or two things from him. Not the prophet that came out six months ago. He's all over WhatsApp, he's all over social media because he knows how to capture his miracles. Is he capturing what he's doing at home? Does that camera show what he's doing with his wife? The journey is long. And there are parts of the journey that surprise you. You get a fat prophetic word, you're blessed, you find the right church, you reach a point in your life where you know, okay, now I'm lost. Fire! You don't feel it. Jesus! You say Jesus with... I want you to hear me. Please, just hear, me what, hear what I'm saying. People are getting healed in church, your relatives are getting more sick and they die. Which one is better? The one that said, God heal my, 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 my so-and-so from cancer, in Jesus' name, amen, and everybody clapped their hands, or the one whom cancer took but did not take faith? Are you with me? The one who cancer took. We need to define now, did the cancer take faith? You see, this is the test. Don't take anything away from you, but you must keep the faith. It's the one who keeps the faith. Don't celebrate with the one that says, I'm healed. That one, we don't know whether or not the healing would determine whether they keep a faith or not. But when you keep the faith, despite what you're hearing, despite your prayer hitting a wall, keep the faith. When you keep the faith, you are on a journey. You understand, I'm, I'm talking about a quality life. What I'm telling you, you will walk with for years. I've been, I've been doing this thing for some time now. In the beginning, I thought that, hey, now that this guy, guy dropped dead in the service while you're sitting there. 
he was with his nurse. And she said to the people, make no mistake, I'm a nurse. This is deceased. I'll grab the mic to teach like we did now. Guy dropped dead. When I woke up to him, I said, and when I saw the man is going, I said, shout Jesus. I don't know what to pray. I said, please shout Jesus, my friend. And he couldn't even utter Jesus. Foam was coming out of his mouth. Silent. Service is silent. People are now looking. This Jesus you teach so emphatically, where is he now? Because I, I, no matter what I teach then, nobody is listening. They want to see. Guy got up. They gave him water. He's, the guy, there were two people that came with him. One is an evangelist for 30 years in Woma. He said, I've never seen a miracle like this. I thought to myself, yo, this will keep the church. The people's faith has shot up. Thank you. Next week, less people. The miracles, don't do it. The prophetic words, they, they are not enough. They are not enough to make somebody take the journey. They are only accessories. The word I'm teaching you now that you are bored with is the one that will keep you 20 years from now. We're not interested how much you have achieved, how loud you can intercede. I want to know how long have you come? How long away have you come? How long have you kept the faith? How long have you kept it on the same level after being booked into the hospital? When you're in the hospital and the doctor's telling you, you may die. When you are praying and asking for safe delivery of a baby and the baby dies, then we know the genuineness of your faith. Was it faith as long as the boy lives? Because if your faith is as long as the boy lives, it means it would die with his death. This is the crazy God that we serve. Okay, let me take the boy. When you stand and the doctor is telling you, your child has died, your wife is dying. Man of God. This is what we heard in September last year. And the doctor said to me, we had to choose to save your wife or the baby. The doctor told my wife, if just a few minutes later, just a few minutes later end of story when you come out of that hospital and you're on a wheelchair for three weeks you are bleeding constantly but at church people just get out of a wheelchair like that you ask yourself god do you hate me i pray for this sister she's healed i pray for my wife nothing genuineness of your faith are you with me because I make you look good or are you with me for the long run you think God is stupid God is a person like you would you want a boyfriend that is with you just because of your looks and where you're going or do you want something for the long run that's what God is saying to you but a lot of you are sitting here you're not here for the long run you're here to see a man you can't wait for me to start prophesying when does he talk when does he start this thing I'm not starting nothing because I know you're not here for the long run. How many deaths, how much misery must we face that defines the complexion of our belief? You know why we can sit here all day, you, come, some, you invite people, hey, the service is too long, the teaching is too long. We can stand here all day because we know, we know whom we're talking about. We don't have a life out there, you have a life out there. We don't have a life out there. We don't have whiskey out there waiting for us. This is it. We are waiting now for the promise. We, we love him. The simplicity of coming here and saying, Pastor D, let's go and pray. Coming to the hall every single time, setting up the chairs, wiping, sweeping, every single Sunday. 
setting up the sound, picking up the instruments, undoing the instruments. What is making us do this over and over without saying, you know what? This is it. I want you to ask your neighbor. I want you to ask your neighbor, please. Are you here for the long run? Stand to your feet.